it's actually a vintage train but my two new grandchildren twins they are enjoying it so much they're four months old and every morning they come and see the chup chup gadi they belong to their father i have made um, a spiritual garden which has temples from around india it has kashi it has from the kamakya temple in assam in guwahati jagannath puri so the flowers and garden are my special passion whatever you do has to be a legacy for the next generation so dr swati piramal uh, thank you for sparing the time and let me tell you that you're such a magnetic personality i mean i can feel your aura your charm and i hope some of it rubs off me by the end <laughs> of this conversation thank you so, so much you're the vice chairperson for piramal group you're the director for the piramal foundation numerous awards and accolades to your name so my question basically is that with so many titles attached to your name but as an individual as a woman how do you describe yourself so i think of myself as a scientist a doctor a philanthropist and also a businesswoman so it's a cross between science technology medicine business yeah. philanthropy yeah. those are the things i care about yeah you know this is often said and i've met so many women i've met women across <coughs> india who are starting up their small businesses and when it comes to women and entrepreneurship the usual i think conditioning or a sort of a bias is that if you're a woman in business it'll probably be beauty it'll probably be <coughs> wellness it'll probably be something about lifestyle uh, did you ever feel that prejudice you know you coming from a science background dwelling into so many things uh, that women usually have been kept away from actually in medicine mm. i think women are naturally caregivers mm. they are they know the healing arts right from the time they give birth yeah to a baby yeah and it is for thousands of years yeah it's not about today yeah so while in the medical field women were less represented when i was in medical college mm -hmm. today i think they actually are more than men yeah in uh, medicine yeah so it just shows that they have the full potential and if you treat them fairly mm. in admissions and everything else i think we'll have a large number of women in all fields including stem including computers including driving cars maybe <laughs> or even making highways or nuclear yeah. engines or you know Finally. our three women who re yes. who uh, led the whole team which went to the moon mars, yeah mm. uh, and mars mm. the mars landing mm. um so i think that uh, given a very good potential yeah. and helping women to touch the sky and reach that unlimited potential that makes them go everywhere absolutely rightfully said yeah. that opportunity i think is crucial yeah. dr parmal i want to talk to you about your childhood <clears throat> about growing up and you did mention that you know how uh, there were not too many women in the medical colleges at that time uh, was it usual when you uh, went into the college or you know from from the sort of backing or opportunity that you got in your childhood coming from a gujarati family you know taking up a degree that would take 5 years for you to complete yeah. uh, at least <laughs> what was it like yes i know when <clears throat> i joined medicine everyone thought i would waste a seat hmm and it was a common metaphor at that time because they said women would get married not practice medicine hmm. and the seats were so precious hmm. i think all that has changed hmm. uh, i did uh, the one thing common between my school and college education when i think back because they were all in beautiful stone buildings so my school was walsingham school in mumbai then i went to xavier's college which beautiful building yeah. then harvard university yes. and uh, my medical college was king edward memorial somehow the architecture of that time yeah. was making something which lasted forever and i think that was uh, maybe rubbed off on me <laughs> on in education and yeah. in healthcare yeah. that whatever you do has to be a legacy for the next generation wow yeah that's beautiful that's a beautiful analogy with dr prema yeah. so tell me after college you got married and um, 
and I say this for the benefit of the many women who are, uh, they feel sort of pressured into the roles that have been decided by society. A lot of women who want to, and especially during the pandemic, there were so many women who uh, started their own, you know, small setups, small businesses. But, uh, you know, there is that role demarcation that you have to be a good daughter-in-law, you have to be a good mother, you have to be a good wife. And then, you know, entrepreneurship comes later. Uh, how does one circumvent <coughs> these pressures? It is, is it possible, you know, from your life and learnings to kind of balance all of this out? I joined medicine for in because of an incident in my life. Okay. I had a little baby at home, a cousin brother, mm -hmm. who had a very bad reaction to a vaccine. He became blue in the face. Mm -hmm. And I saw my mother reach out and find a doctor mm -hmm. and save his life. Mm -hmm. And the respect that the doctor got in my home, I'll never forget. Yeah. And I thought, ah, I would like to be a doctor. So that was one. And the second was when I was, um, I had got married in the middle of my MBBS actually, even Achoo. before I finished. Okay. And I was driving along Parel one day and I saw this little girl who was paralyzed from neck below. Hmm. And I, I was very disturbed, you know, hmm. I, I thought she couldn't play, hmm. she couldn't enjoy life. Hmm. And I vowed to have a no polio zone in Parel area because they were all migrant workers okay. coming in the mills right. at that time. Right. And uh, with my friends in medical school, I got together and made skits and talked about all the myths. And I said, this is a virus, it's polio, hmm. and we have vaccines to prevent it. Hmm. And so we did uh, from 25,000 patients, which I had in my little clinic, it went down to zero. Oh. So we really did achieve a no polio zone. Oh. That gave me a taste of public health yeah. and said, if I can make that much difference to yeah. people's lives, yeah. uh, that's the subject I want to study. Yeah. So that's how I went back to medical school, went to Harvard, yes. studied public health, came back and then tried to apply all the lessons I learned to the community around yeah. me. And I do want to mention that when you went <coughs> to Harvard, how old were you, ma'am? I was 38, I had two children. And you know, that is a very important thing that I think women must remember is upskilling yourself. You know, there is, there is always opportunity to learn more. <coughs> but what comes in the way sometimes is, again, you know, I think mom guilt. You had kids then when you went to Harvard? I had two kids. I, in fact, I took them along and I must say I was a very supportive family. The great thing about Indian families is that you have hubby, sister-in-laws yeah. who look after your children. Yeah. Um, you know, which they did. Hmm. And uh, then I took my children whenever we had a break or they had, Diwali, you know, they were in school. Hmm. They had Diwali holidays, they would come and visit me. Yeah. And I, I could see the influence of that on them later on in life. Right. <clears throat> my son went to Harvard, my daughter went hmm. to Stanford. Hmm. And maybe at that young age that influenced them hmm. that to see my mother learning yeah. And therefore, I'm also going to try that hard yes. in academia. Absolutely. I mean, I say this all the time <coughs> that it is our previous generation. It is yeah. leaders like you who have actually paved the way for us, you know, for entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs today um, to even dream that dream. Uh, so thank you for, <laughs> for doing that and inspiring us. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you also, Dr. Piramal, about that when you came into the Piramal family, it was mostly textiles and then there was a diversification. Uh, uh, you know, uh, did you feel uh, an opportunity in the family where you could put your skills on the table and there was, you know, like we talked about that there is that, you know, that, uh, that reception of idea, that reception of um, the skills that you brought in um, that helped in the diversification. Do you see it like that? So uh, <clears throat> our family business is more than a century old. Correct. In textiles, we were in Murarji mills and mm. it still exists as one yes. of the few surviving textile groups. Mm. And my husband thought that we should diversify. Mm. And this was a serendipitous opportunity which a pharmaceutical company was available and we acquired it. Mm. But I could contribute just being on the board, being helping uh, people to understand this new field. It yeah. was completely different. <laughs> yeah. There we had 25,000 workers, here we had 1500. Mm. The technology was really, mm. uh, you know, top of the class of the, of the world, world class quality. Mm. Mm. And here it was more about making a piece of cloth. Yeah. And it was a mass manufacturing type of operation. Mm. So they were very different. Mm. One had intellectual property, one didn't, mm. one had patents, one had 
you know, so the whole to, to do a completely new skill mm -hmm. and a completely new business. Yeah. So that was a very exciting challenge. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned about you know being on boards and <coughs> you know you've also in your thirty uh, years or and more been on boards of outside uh, companies as well. Um, as a woman in a boardroom, you know I'll tell you what I sometimes feel I deepen my voice a little bit. I dress you know there is this compulsion of dressing like a man. Did you ever um, feel that you had to rely on those tropes um, if you know to assert your presence? as a woman in a boardroom? No, I, I never felt that. Mm. But you know, I would always do a lot of preparation. Mm. I was the first woman uh, president of Asocham. Yes. In 90 years of its existence. And yeah. before that, all men. Mm. So I would, um, the preparation I would do, uh, and that's a little secret, I would call <laughs> other women who I knew were on top of that field right. and ask them their advice. Hmm. Not many men do that, but yeah. I would do it <laughs> all, every time. Like um, I would go to visit the Reserve Bank governor, I would phone all my banker friends, hmm. women who hmm. were all CEOs, hmm. and say, What should I say? What's the top of his mind? And hmm. then she would, they would tell me that, you know, talk about this, take, talk about this. And I would very happily <laughs> speak about that. Yeah. And I would read a thousand pages of that subject before yeah. I would open my mouth. Hmm. So I would speak on nuclear energy, making highways, um, you know, the economy. Hmm. Uh, I'm a doctor. I know science and technology, yeah. but I didn't know so much about yeah. all these other fields. Hmm. But I, I took it as an opportunity to increase my learning curves deeply yeah. and really speak about that. That's very That insightful. was very helpful. Yeah. Then all the other boards, I never fail to do the preparation yeah. and always uh, try and serve thinking about the customer, thinking about the small shareholder, what would he want to ask mm. and try to represent their interests. I serve on the board of a French Italian company called uh, Essilor Luxottica, okay. started in Italy by the chairman who was Italian then uh, merged with a French company. And I was surprised that they asked me to be on their CSR committee to chair it, hmm. to talk about climate change as well as hmm. healthcare. They hmm. look at eye health as one of their okay. core obje okay. objectives. And I was really surprised that they did ask me. I was far away from Europe actually, hmm. in, in India. Hmm. And uh, I think I, I take it as a challenge to understand European regulation, European laws, hmm. to see what they feel about climate change hmm. and try and see what they're doing in Africa or you know globally. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting because I make it a point to visit all these countries yeah. and see yeah. their operations. Yeah. I mean it's so insightful Dr. Piramal because you rightfully said I think preparation you know do do the work you know that will yeah. give you the confidence. Yes. I think that's really in insightful and the other thing that is so interesting is the sisterhood that um, you know that yeah, you had a like a network of um, yeah. women who were willing to uh, help you out yeah. how important is yeah. that in the in the journey for a woman leader i think women naturally network hmm. they network in their office they network at home hmm. they always have a support system because hmm. they're trying to do so many things hmm. so we just do it so well hmm. so why not use that facet uh, yeah. even in the workplace yeah and if you don't understand something pick up the phone and ask for help yeah and it is uh, you know people are always willing to reach out and help you hmm. so I also wanted to ask you Dr. Paramal that uh, now today at your stature uh, what is the sort of do you see um, a gap in women in the workforce and is there anything that you are actively looking at doing to ha to make work environment more inclusive for women what will it take my story started in my research center mm -hmm. where there were very few women in STEM, maybe mm, yes. 20, 30 years ago. And how was I to get women who are very skilled at filing patterns at, at really finding that new discovery molecule, which mm. nobody in the world had found. Mm. And uh, so I really made an effort mm. to get more women scientists through the door. And when it went from zero to 50% women, I felt that that was achieved. And the patterns that they filed, they were world class. Mm. Nobody could break them, nobody could uh, compete. Mm. And I, f I was so proud 
that even today in one of my centers which I visited just a few days ago, there were 150 women scientists who sat in the wow. room with me and yeah. talked about science. Yeah. So um, if you make the workplace attractive, yeah. it attracts more and more women. Yeah. So I fight for the minor things even, a crash, you know, making women yeah. safe from, yeah. from uh, bad material in their computers, hmm. or walking them home safely out through the door, hmm. making sure that they reach, hmm. even minor things like that. Yeah. We make sure that uh, they are treated well. Yeah. And treating them fairly, you know, mm. everybody equal, mm. treating everybody as a bright mind, mm. you know, is, is, whether it's male or female, it mm. doesn't matter. Mm. And once you get that idea that everyone is treated on merit, mm. uh, well, things just start to work much better. Yeah. Yeah. And people start to, f to fulfill their full potential. Right, right. Um, I also want to talk to you about um, you know, having a purpose in entrepreneurship, you know, how important do you think are goals uh, based on giving back to the community? Um, the work that you've been doing over years um, uh, as part of uh, the foundation, um, how important do you see that in the overall um, strategy and, and the values that Piramal has? Yeah, so we believe that uh, you have to do well in business, of course, mm -hmm. but you have to also do good. Hmm. And then we have our very strong set of values, which are knowledge, action, care, and impact. Hmm. And everything we do revolves around those values. Hmm. And so we said, we have to care about the communities around us. We have to make the world a better place. Hmm. We have to make a positive difference in people's lives. And we go out of the way for disadvantaged communities. Uh, whether it is special children, whether it is women, whether it is people living in very remote areas where there is no land even, mm. there is no phones, there is no electricity mm. and that's where we go um, in many areas in the northeast of mm. India, uh, they have floods and then the flood, the river takes away their land mm. and people live there mm. without any of these facilities mm. which you are used to in a city. Yeah. And so we try and go to those places, tribal areas. We have something which we call a tribal health collaborative, mm. which works in the 10 million people, or 10% of India's population, 100 million people mm. uh, across India, across many states. Yeah. And then we work in what we call the aspirational district collaborative, which is where the health indicators were way behind mm. the national average. Mm. And that, uh, you know, where infant mortality, maternal mortality, much worse than everywhere else. Yeah. So we work in those areas to improve the lives of people in health, education and water. Right. So we, f we believe the foundation is our core purpose to mm. make the world a better place. Um, talk to me about your leadership style. Um, is it, um, uh, you're, are you an empathetic leader or are you a strict taskmaster? What, what works for you? Well, I, I do like people to be, you know, know what they're doing, hmm. to really be good at their job. So hmm. that means that you have to have that knowledge, that hmm. expertise. Hmm. And I like people who build that knowledge. Hmm. That's why it's one of our values hmm. to look at innovation, to look at knowledge, expertise, and to build a sort of golden aura, as you say, around that idea of knowledge. Hmm. And then they have to act on that knowledge. Hmm. You must act quickly and efficiently mm. on whatever you know mm. and act correctly. Mm. And then finally, whatever you do, if you act with care, mm. you know, you act with, uh, with passion, with caring about people around you, the community, in mm. whatever you do, mm. uh, it, I think it always, always has an impact. Mm. So uh, we use these values to determine how we work mm. with each other at home mm. on, in everything that we do. Mm. And it works for us very well. It mm. works every time. Mm. So I would say uh, these are things which are important to me. Mm. But I think the younger generation also has one more dimension. Yeah. Uh, is the digital world. Yes. They're very good at it. Yes. And I think that it can make dramatic impact mm. on healthcare in particular, mm. digitizing, transforming India through the digital world. Yeah. 
and when I see my children and I, I, I think my grandchildren, they're so much better than me <laughs> uh, in these areas mm. and I think that that will also change the world. Mm -hmm. When you talk about healthcare for the Indian uh, scenario, Indian society, do you think that access to healthcare, do you see that gendered at all? Do you think that, um, do, you, do you see that as a challenge also to take, uh, you know, primary health care to women in our country uh, as different to, you know, uh, the other half of the population? So I imagined a little girl mm. in 2047 mm. uh, where we will celebrate our 100 years of independence. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a little poem on the dream that I had for her. Mm. May I read please, it? Please, please. Um, Little flower, you were hidden in my heart. I want to give you hope which is hidden in the dark. My daughter, I have a dream for you. I dream of an India where women are equal, where my daughter is not one of the missing ones, where you are strong and energetic, where you will not have to walk miles to get clean water, where a woman is not just a deity to be worshipped, but a flame for the soul. I wish I could take a quiet corner in your heart, little flower, where the stars will talk to you of hope and the sky will bend down to show you the limitless, where reason makes strong laws to protect you. For fear of losing you, I hold you tight in love and protection equal to all. The fairy mistress of dreams is flying towards you. I dream of a day, little flower, when you, my dear daughter, will not be driven by the compulsion of want or fear, can be well educated and not marry too early, and have children after you become an adult, where worry for food does not cloud your horizon, where you can earn for your family, where you and your future children are healthy, where women are empowered, let them see your face and know you are the future. Go and stand amidst the disbelieving hearts to create a new India where you, my daughter, are a vital, powerful economic force. Little flower, my song will be a faithful star where the dark moon is on your road and will give you sight in the heart of things. My song will be like a pair of wings to your dreams. It's beautiful and really touches, you know, touches a chord and really the sort of future that we do want to see for our daughters. Thank you. Thank you for saying this. I also now want to touch upon some of your personal aspects, if I may. Um, your style. I mean, this is something so much elegance and grace that you exude. Even the sari that you're wearing today. It's beautiful. Talk to me a little bit about your style and like I said that you've made a statement in your sarees and you didn't have to rely on pantsuits. No, I think <laughs> I like to be an ambassador for my country mm -hmm. and I like to wear things which are hand woven or something where the human hand has mm -hmm. touched it mm -hmm. uh, to create its beauty. Mm -hmm. So we have such rich tapestries of textiles embroideries. Hmm. This happens to be my mother's sari hmm. and uh, it is a Parsi gara from uh, uh, the region of, where it came from Persia, hmm. the whole um, idea of the embroidery on silk. But now it's so much part of our own heritage, yeah. our rich textile heritage. Yeah. And so wherever I go, I try to, um, to, you know, promote the textiles. For example, I was a president of Asocham. I realized that saris are going down. The mm. weavers were really losing it. Mm. So I connected them with fashion designers yeah. from every part of India. And really, by, after that, they've become part of the fashion scene. Yeah. Uh, whether they were Petanese or Patolas mm. or Banarasis or mm. South Indian saris or, you know, the Mizo and the Nagaland yeah. uh, costumes. Yeah. They, we are so rich. Yeah. We are so rich in our heritage yeah. and I thought always to be an ambassador for that. So yeah. whenever I'm abroad, I actually would wear a sari yeah. rather than a pantsuit. Uh, tell me, Dr. Piramal, um, does a leader um, find time to pursue their own, you've written a beautiful poetry, do you, do you find time to pursue your own hobbies, own passions, you have a beautiful collection of paintings, do you dwell in art as well? 
as you grow older, you have to keep learning new skills. Absolutely. So this year, I said uh, after the pandemic, mm. I had a lot of time. I started to learn Urdu because mm -hmm. I wasn't very good at it or didn't understand the meaning of words. Yeah. I started to learn French, <coughs> and I'm I'm doing the violin because my grandson wanted to learn <laughs> the violin, so I thought I should learn with him. <laughs> and it's quite a I difficult didn't instrument. I realize it was so <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I couldn't remember what my last <laughs> lesson was and he was merrily playing away. So, <laughs> so I guess uh, when you, uh, you know, when you start late and uh, you have to go slow in learning It's everything. never too late. <laughs> but it's always good to learn new things. Yeah, it and who, who plays the Tanpura active. there? That is my mother-in-law's Tanpura. She was a singer. Hmm. She used to sing bhajans. Hmm. So exquisite. So she passed away uh, two years ago and we mm, keep sorry. her Tanpura as yeah. a reminder yeah. at home. <laughs> yeah. yeah, There is so much conversation about um, flexibility. We've seen two years of the pandemic where women have juggled, um, you know, work from home um, and now we're coming back to, uh, what do you prefer? What do you prefer, an in-person interview <laughs> or the Zoom <laughs> boxes? Actually both because hmm. uh, Zoom is very useful when you're on the run hmm. and you need to make a meeting. Hmm. Sometimes even in people in the same city are doing Zoom instead of traveling. So yeah. it saves time and money and cost hmm. which is very uh, you know rare in this this world where yeah. you need to do everything yeah. uh, you know in, in double quick time. Uh, and uh, I think in person there's no substitute <laughs> for that. Uh, in meetings or in teamwork, in group meetings where yeah. you can actually brainstorm together and come up with a better idea. Yeah. So each has a new place, I think, Makes in the workplace. Yeah. In fact, in our own workplace, we use a lot of different programs mm -hmm. to help gender and to help diversity. We have a program called Ignite, which is supposed to ignite performance and things like that. And we have so many opportunities hmm. for both men and women, hmm. but in particular women want to do something new, learn something new. Yeah. Uh, we have that. And then we have even in the rural villages, I'm happy to say, we have something called the Karuna Fellowship, okay. which we uh, make uh, women learn computers. Hmm. And they're extraordinarily good at it. Yeah. <clears throat> and they learn uh, to <coughs> so fast and they're able to do accounts and things like that. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. And what is it that you splurge on? My favorite thing, and hmm. you, you may have seen it as you come in, is gardening, is yeah. flowers. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I try to grow rare orchids, rare flowers from around India hmm. and into this very narrow space in Mumbai, which is right next to the traffic. <laughs> but they grow, the flowers love it. They love the uh, attention and care, yeah. I have made um, a spiritual garden yeah. which has temples from around India. It has Kashi, it has from the Kamakya temple in Assam, in Gauhati, Jagannath Puri. Mm. It has little miniatures yeah. where I work with toy makers who are artisans. Oh. They're wood carvers and they make these beautiful little temples oh. and it adorns my driveway yeah. with full of flowers. Yeah. My children love it, our visitors <laughs> like it, and just next to us are these honking horns. <laughs> <laughs> so the flowers and garden are my special passion. Yeah. I took part in the uh, Chelsea Flower Show some years ago, 2018, hmm. and we won a, a gilt medal. Uh, it was the first time an Indian garden was in Chelsea. Oh. And we had flowers from um, called the Himalayan blue poppy, hmm. which is a rare flower taken from India many years ago by the British. Hmm. Grows in Scotland, but is almost extinct in India. Okay. And we showcased that and people loved it and uh, we got a medal. So I was very happy with that. When you look back at your journey, what are the big milestones that make you proud of all that you've accomplished? My journey's been very exciting, many different milestones. Hmm. The ones which I value are the ones of a distinguished alumnus from my alma mater, uh, Harvard School of Public Health. Mm. It was a distinguished alumnus award. Mm. Uh, then of course the Padma Shri, which from the President yes. of India. Yes. It's always nice to have. And uh, the one which I was really uh, 
uh, overwhelmed by was uh, from the French government by President Macron mm -hmm. before him. Uh, President Mitterrand, they gave me the Chevalier Award and the Legion of Honor. And these are uh, France's top military or mm -hmm. non-military awards mm -hmm. which they mm -hmm. give to civilians. Civilians, yeah. And uh, I was so happy uh, about that and I just started learning French. <laughs> so I, I said my whole uh, acceptance speech in French. In French. <laughs> <laughs> Serenity <Yeah>. again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but uh, just knowing about French culture. Yeah. And also got a, a fellow, uh, the Japan Fellow Award is for one person in the whole country every okay, year okay. who then becomes a fellow and they share knowledge. It's a mm. knowledge sharing award almost. Okay. In a way, I feel that uh, the work that I do has expanded not only in my own country, but to others. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that I can make that difference to whatever I do, whether it's in Africa, whether mm. it's in Europe or America to help uh, to make the world a better place. Yeah, the global impact. So much you've achieved. Um, what is next? What do you want to do? And what is the sort of legacy that you want to leave behind? Um, two things. One is that, you know, I walk into a room, think that I'm going to retire and just enjoy <laughs> life. And I just look and hear about young women in our tribal areas and how much they mm. suffer. And I say, no Not way yet. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do much more, I need to work harder and I need to reach, yeah. reach them somehow that all the troubles that they have yes. should be lifted. Yeah. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And second, what I would love to do if I had all the time in the world and nothing else to do, I would play with my grandchildren. <laughs> and I would uh, you know, just teach them about science, about medicine, about innovation, mm -hmm. about uh, art and culture. Uh, about gardens and flowers, uh, fairies and gnomes. I would teach them all the things that I love and uh, uh, books and <laughs> yeah, so I, if th that's the one thing I'd love to do uh, all the time. Just give up everything else and play. Thank you so much Thank for your time, Dr. Piramal. It's been an absolute pleasure sitting with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.